Good morning, everybody. And welcome to Abingdon on the 4th of November, the, the day before we all go into lockdown. So myself and Mr. Rundle are here to film something for our school's Remembrance um, Day celebrations. And I thought I'd like to bring you all here to Abingdon to have a look at what's behind me. Now, monuments like this began to spring up all over the United Kingdom in villages, towns and cities from around about 1920, around about 100 years ago. And this rather splendid memorial was put here by the people of Abingdon and it was opened in 1921. It cost 800 pounds to build this and that money was raised through what was called um, public subscription. People giving to a charitable, charitable fund. Today we'd call it crowdfunding. Now why did they build it? Well, the clue is down here and what's written beneath me here. It's a memorial originally meant for the 228 young men from Abingdon who went to fight in the First World War and who died and sadly didn't come home. It was opened in September 1921 and when it was opened the good people of Abingdon had absolutely no idea that around about 20 years later they'd be adding 55 more names because of another war that happened, World War II. Now for the past over 30 years, myself and my wife, members of my family, have come here on Remembrance Sunday along with members of the cadet, the army cadets in Abingdon, the sea cadets, the air training corps, um, Abingdon schools, combined cadet force, soldiers from Dalton Barracks and before that members of the RAF, local scouts, brownies, uh, cubs, guides, the town band and people of Abingdon. They gather here on Remembrance Sunday for the formal act of remembrance and sadly this year we can't do it. It's a great shame. And for those 30 years I often saw a little wooden cross like this and many of them are, are placed on the grass turf that's placed around this memorial. Our family put two down to remember the names of two members of our family who died in the Great War. We write their names on and the days they died and where they died. But this one cross that I kept seeing year after year, and still keep seeing it, only ever had four words written on it. And those words were, the Kings of Abingdon. And in order to find out why that's important, we need to go round the back of the memorial. All right, here we are around the back. Now there are three panels on this memorial that contain the 228 names of the young men that died in the First World War. And this is the biggest one. There's one round the side there and one round here. They're much narrower. And if you look in the central column, you'll notice that there are a number of names there, look, all with the same surname, King. There are seven of them. Six of them were all members of the same family. Some of them were brothers, they were cousins, okay? The King's family in Abingdon during the First World War was a big family. It was a big extend, extended family, multi-generational, grandma, granddad, loads of aunts and uncles and cousins running around all over the place. But these are not the only six individuals that the King family actually sent to war. They sent 14, one four, 14 of their sons to war six of them didn't come back. Now for the most part monuments like this are part and parcel of the street furniture. We don't we don't recognize them until Remembrance Sunday and loads of people walk past here and see the names and they probably don't really think about it. They might just see a list of names but the thing is every single name on here represents a life that was lost and a real life and what we hope to do now in the next few minutes is take you on a little journey because I know where all 14 members of the King family who went to war, I know where they lived. I'm going to show you where they lived and at the end of it I'm going to show you how I 
I've got a connection to these boys on this memorial. A connection to all 14 of the King boys that went to war. It's not a connection about, are they members of my family? No, they're not. But it's a connection nonetheless. And I also hope by the end of this piece to show you, every single one of you watching, how you also have got a connection to these boys. And to show you where all 14 of the King boys lived, we need to go for a bit of a walk. We need to walk up there a bit, up Ox Street. Okay, here we are. We've walked a minute or two up Ox Street. To give an idea of how far we've come, well, just down there, in a moment, you might be able to see there are two big poppies um, on lampposts. That marks where the War Memorial is. So what, what are we, 500 metres? Less than that, must be. Anyway, here is what is now known as Fitchett Yard. Fitchett Yard used to be a big place where people sold coal, a big pile of coal. In fact, when I first came to Abingdon 30 years ago, we used to drive our car in here and actually buy our coal to take home. Well, these buildings behind me were built on the site of two or three very old buildings that were demolished in the 1930s. And in one of them, Harry King lived. One of the boys who went out to fight, he returned home in 1919. And what's interesting about Harry is that he actually volunteered in August 1914 and fought the whole of the way through the war and eventually came home five years later in 1919. During those five years, Harry was wounded, but he came home. We need to go further up there now, a little bit further. Now we've walked about a minute from where we were before. We've walked a little bit further up Ox Street and what I want you to look at is this side of the road. It's this big building called Mayotte's House. Now the building you're looking at there is only two or three years old actually, but what used to be there a hundred years ago were the beginning of some of the worst housing in Abingdon. The King family were not wealthy. They came from the poorest people in the town. Across the road, somewhere on that site, was the original 124 Ox Street. And it's there, from there, that in 1916, Arthur King went to join the British Army. Now, unlike other members of the King family who volunteered, Arthur had to go. Because in 1916, the government passed a law that said that all men between the ages of 18 and 40, who were fit and healthy, they had to go to fight. So in 1916, Arthur left home from his home on that site, went to war. He was wounded a year later, so badly wounded, in fact, that he came home in 1917 and left the army. We need to move on now. We've walked about another minute. We're almost at the top of Ox Street now. And here, I'm gonna tell the story of quite a few lads from the King family. And to do this, I've gotta look at my notes, kids, because I can't remember all this because there's so much information. But if you look behind me, you can see number 169, Ox Street. It's now a rather nice piano studio where people go and learn the piano. Uh, but it wasn't like that back in 1914, 1918. The house was shared and part of the King family, one, one part of the King family, one small family group, rented part of that building, maybe one of the floors. So who lived there? Well, here we go. Edwin, Edwin Kin, killed 13th of October, 1915. His brother Jack killed 26th of April 1916 and I want you to remember that 26th of April it's important. The third brother William 
He joined the army in 1915. He survived and returned home at the end of the war. And the youngest brother, another Harry, joined the army, volunteered 1915. He too survived and he came home. Now to learn about the next branch of the family, we have to look across the road. All right, now as I'm walking towards you, look over there. You can see a long, long line of modern flats refurbished in the 1990s that run all the way down this side, Ox Street. Just behind the position of these buildings used to be what were known as the Ox Street Court. Again, some of the worst housing in Abingdon. And some of the King boys lived on this side of the road. They lived in houses that were right up against the River Ock. It's the river that gives this street its name. And their houses regularly used to flood when the River Ock burst its banks. The housing was damp, cramped, overcrowded, and in the 1930s they were condemned. They were described as slums. And they were demolished. And this big block of flats that you can see here was built originally in the 1950s, just after the Second World War. Now, I'm going to look at my notes again because there's a lot of information. Here it comes. Are you ready for this? Okay. So somewhere on this site were court number 22 and court number 24, Ox Street Court, Abingdon. All right. Percy, he's on the War Memorial. He was killed on the 10th of September 1914. He was already a soldier before the war broke out. He died in the first major battle that the British Army fought in the First World War, the Battle of Mons, and he's buried in Belgium. His brother Frederick joined in 1915. He was wounded in 1917, but he wasn't wounded in France or Belgium. He was wounded in modern day Iraq, then called Mesopotamia, a long, long way from Ox Street. Alfred, the youngest cousin who lived at number 22, he was a conscript. He had to go to war in 1916. He joined the, the, the army and he fortunately returned home. But his war also wasn't in France or in Belgium. His war was in a place that was then called Palestine, part of modern day Egypt, Israel, Syria and Jordan. Now, so far, everybody that we've met, that, that we have met from the King family have lived down Ox Street all the way to the War Memorial. But there was one branch of the family that managed to, I suppose, get a little bit further up the hill to some slightly better quality housing. And that's where we're going now. And it's a bit of a walk. We have to walk up there and up Spring Road. That's where we're off now. Well, we've walked for about two minutes and already you can see it's a bit quieter. Ox Street is way at the bottom of this road there as it turn, curls away. OK, and we are actually slightly uphill when I mentioned to you they moved up the hill. If any of you know Abingdon at all, to give an idea of where we are, well, this footpath curves away into Cemetery Road where we're going next and over there uh, oh, could I throw a rugby ball? Probably not. But Abingdon School is just over there, just the other side of Albert Park. Anyway, we need to go down Cemetery Road now. OK, we've walked to the very top of Cemetery Road and as you can see now, it's pretty quiet. And I have to show you just part of this building behind me, these two windows. This is now part of what is the MG Car Club. It's rather nice in Abingdon during the summertime because we see these lovely vintage cars driving up and down around here coming to visit the car club. But a hundred years ago, that part of the building wasn't there. It was a garden. And this older part of the building was actually two separate buildings. This one with a nice front door. 
was number 12 and number 11 was this much more modest smaller building and when I first came to Abingdon before that was built there there was a, a doorway in down the side number 11 cemetery road the last branch of the King family that we're going to look at and again there's a lot of information kids I've got to use my notes I think it's quite sad this so I apologize if I choke and I make I, well no I make no apology kids actually all right anyway here we go Arthur Arthur King he was a soldier before the war he was already a soldier he joined the army okay he died on the 9th of April 1917 I want you to remember that date, that's important, and that's the second time I've said that to you. He was the eldest. His brother George joined the Navy in August 1914. George died of wounds in hospital somewhere in the south of England in October 1918, about five weeks before the war ended. Herbert, he joined the army, he volunteered in 1915 and he was killed on the 11th of October 1918, four weeks before the end of the war. The family lost two sons within a week of each other. William, living in this little house, I haven't finished yet, William, he was a conscript, he had to go to war. He went to war in 1917 and he was wounded in January 1918 and was invalided out of the army and he was back home here in Abingdon just before the end of the war. And Percy, he joined the army in August 1914, right at the start. He fought all the way through and I'm pleased to say it's the last name we're going to talk about. And Percy came home. Now when we started doing this, back in the centre of town by the War Memorial, um, I said to you, I'm going to give you a connection. And what we have to do now is, to explore that connection, is walk back the way we came a bit. Now throughout this film, or documentary perhaps we should call it, I've made quite a few references to the fact that I have lived in Abingdon for about 30 years. And it's when I started to investigate the King's Boys that I found the connection. It's not a connection about family, it's a connection about place. It's this place, number two Cemetery Road, because this is where I live. I live on the same street as the lads from the branch of the King family, just up there at number 11. Their names are on the War Memorial, certainly for three of them. They must have walked up and down this same street as I do, as, as I do almost every day. They were real people. They live in the same community that I do today. Who knows, they may have even walked past here and stared into our front room window sometime. It's decorated with poppies because my wife Sue, for many years now, has actually gone out and sold poppies on behalf of the British Legion, raising money for the poppy appeal as we get close to Remembrance Sunday. Sadly, because of the virus, she can't do that this year, so she's put them in the window. We've had a few people actually knock on the door and actually buy them at the door, put their money in the top. And she's just, you know those wonderful things with credit cards, the sort of... Um, contactless things. We've got a contactless machine in there. Believe it or not, it works through the window. That's in my connection. I live in Abingdon, so do the King boys. I live in the same street as some of them. This is my life. It was part of theirs. I also promised you that I was going to give you a connection, a connection that every single one of you have got to the Kings of Abingdon. I asked you to remember two dates when two of the King's boys died. Those two boys died at the Battle of Arras in northern France in 1917. Three boys from St Hugh's died in that same battle. One of the King's boys died on the 9th of April 1917, on the first day of the Battle of Arras. 
the same day as a teacher from St Hughes, a man called Mr Cox, who taught mathematics. He died the same day at the same battle. All six of these people, all six of these young men that died also share something else in common. Neither of them have a known grave and every single one of their names is on the Arras Memorial in northern France. A memorial to all those soldiers whose bodies were never found or were, una were unable to be identified. And that's the connection that you've got with the Kings of Abingdon. You went to St Hugh's. Three boys and a teacher from St Hugh's died at the Battle of Arras. Two members of the King's family fought in the Battle of Arras and also died. It links us all together. This is my kind of history, folks, and this is what I really love. So I would encourage you, if you've got a war memorial in your town or your village, start digging. See if you can find out something about the men whose names are on that memorial, because you never know. Like me, you might find out you have a connection with them. Thanks for listening.